And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. It's available on Pacifica Radio and Progressive Radio Network and Soundtune, uh, SoundCloud and Stitcher and iTunes and the comprehensive list of all of the shows going back over 10 years is at opednews.com slash podcasts, which uh, I publish, where you'll find a lot of uh, different progressive news and opinions. My guest for this show is Richard T. Hughes. He is Distinguished Professor of Emeritus at both Pepperdine University and Messiah College, and he's the author, co-author, or editor of more than a dozen books. The one we're going to talk about is Myths America Lives By, White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning. Great to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Ron. It's great to be here. So let's start off with some basics. What's a myth? A myth, the way I define a myth, is simply a story that gives us meaning. It's a story we live by. Um, a myth, the word, a lot of people think of myth as something that's untrue. I think uh, of, of a myth as something that may be true, it may not be true. That's really immaterial. But the point is, it gives us meaning, gives us grounding. We orient our lives by these stories that, that uh, they're sort of polar stars for the way we live our lives. Okay. And uh, now this is a, a second edition of the book that, that right. came out recently. An earlier version came out uh, maybe 13, 14. 2003. 2003, okay. Uh -huh. And uh, you, you, you go through a collection of American myths. And, and, but in this book, you say that you left out the most important one. I did. That's exactly right. So... so in 2003, uh, this, this book that was published in 2003 really grew out of a course that I taught at Pepperdine. Uh, and I talked a good bit about the, the myths that, Rob, I really grew up with these myths. When I was growing up as a kid in West Texas, no one taught me these myths. I just absorbed them. Everyone I knew absorbed them. Uh, notions like America is a Christian nation, America is an innocent nation chosen nation, a millennial nation ushering in the golden age for all humankind, uh, nature's nation, the nation that's simply in sync with the way things are meant to be. You know, I just absorbed this stuff. And so I wrote this book really in the aftermath of uh, the 9-11 attacks. And it was my way of trying to think about those attacks and how the nation had responded to those attacks. So it came out in 2003, now fast forward nine years, 2012, and I met at the National Meeting of the American Academy of Religion on a panel reviewing James Cone's very important The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And when I was invited to be on that panel, I thought, oh boy, you know, how can I, as a white male, say anything meaningful about the lynching tree. So I decided I wouldn't critique the book at all. I just tell my story in light of James Cone's constructs. There were probably 400 scholars in the room. 75% of them were African-American. It's a good thing I didn't try to critique the lynching tree as a white male. I really have nothing of substance I can contribute, I think, to that conversation. So I, I talked about these myths and how they shaped my thinking about race and about the nation. And when I sat down at the panelist table after giving my little spiel, one of the panelists, an African-American scholar named James Noel, recently deceased from San Francisco Theological Seminary. Noel leans over to me and he says, Professor, you left out the most important of all the American myths. You just left it out. And I said, really, what did I leave out? He said, Professor, you left out the driving myth. It's the myth of white supremacy. And I had never, I was 69 years old when he said that to me, Rob. And that there's a lesson there. The fact that I'd thought about American myths, I'd written about race, I've been interested in race for years and years. And, and the notion that white supremacy is the driving American myth had never once crossed my radar screen until James Noel said that to me. And when he first said it, in my mind, 
I push back a little. I'm thinking, you know, hey, I wrote a book on this. You're telling me I missed the most important American myth? But Noel set me to thinking. And the more I thought about it, the more I began to realize that, yes, indeed, it is the driving American myth. And the reason we don't recognize it, most white Americans don't get it, we don't have to think about it. Black Americans get it. They think about it. They have to think about it. We don't get it. It's, it's the air we breathe. It's the water we swim in. We don't even see it. And we never think about it. So when someone like Noel says to me, you left out the most important American myth, I'm thinking, really? But in point of fact, I did. So that's when I went back to the University of Illinois Press, the publisher, and I said, what do you think about a second edition? And let's build this whole book around the theme of white supremacy. And they said, let's do it. So that's how the book, the second edition, came about. Now, you've corresponded with me a bit in looking at bottom up and top down, the theme of the show. And you say that myths are bottom up. Talk about that a bit. Well, a myth, you know, no one, you can't, I can't, or you can't, I mean, no, or no president or no king or no uh, imperial power can, can frame a myth and impose that on the people. A myth grows out of a collective understanding, uh, out of shared experience over a long period of time. So uh, the, the myth, for example, the myth that the United States is nature's nation, the nation that's in sync with the way things were meant to be. I mean, that's clearly articulated in the Declaration of Independence. You know, Thomas Jefferson says, we hold these truths to be, what? Self-evident, because he says these truths are rooted in nature. So this nation is the nation that's simply grounded in the way thing, things are meant to be. No one superimposes that vision on the nation. It percolates up out of the times. It, it was a byproduct of the 18th century enlightenment. And of course, this nation is a 18th century enlightenment born nation. So, I mean, a myth this clearly always comes from the bottom up. But the interesting thing is these myths then, having been born from the bottom up, then are used by top down powers to uh, manipulate people, to uh, pursue certain political objectives. Uh, all these myths have been used by political powers and imperial powers along the way, even though the myths originated bottom up. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about the other myths that you uh, cite in the book. You've, you've listed them. Give us a little bit on each one of them. You just talked about the nature myth. Is there anything more you need to say about that? I might say a little more about that, but let me, let me take this chronologically. Okay. So the very first American myth is the myth of the chosen nation. And this, this is the first myth because it's the myth that's brought to these shores by the New England Puritans, or the Puritans who settled New England. Uh, they imagined for many, many years that England was the chosen nation. But when they didn't get their way in England, religiously and politically, they fled England, they came to these shores, and uh, one way to illustrate this myth is uh, John Bradford, the first governor of, of uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, drew the parallel between the, between the journey the Puritans made from England to North America, crossing the Red Sea, and likened England to Egypt. And so uh, the Atlantic Ocean becomes their Red Sea, and New England now becomes the promised land, and, and now they become the new chosen people. So th they, they think of themselves as very much analogous to the chosen people uh, fleeing Egypt, going into the promised land, and so on. So the, that myth has been with us ever since the, the, uh, the Puritans settled New England. And I think of all the presidents who have really pushed that myth Ronald Reagan probably did so more than any other president. He, he constantly referred to America's chosen for a special mission in the world. Uh, 
So that myth has been alive and well for a long, long time. The second myth is the no, one I just want to be clear. That's Amer that America was chosen by God. By God, absolutely. Yeah, not just chosen by some force, but God chose this nation for a special mission in the world. The Puritans believe that deeply. The myth worked its way in, into, the, into the collective consciousness of Puritans and then into the collective consciousness of Americans. When I was a kid growing up in West Texas in the 1940s and 50s and early 60s, I mean, they, these were ideas that everyone just assumed. No, no one questioned them. Of course, God has chosen America for a special mission in the world. So presidents, politicians could play on that, and they have. Second myth, the one we talked about a minute ago, nature's nation. Uh, this myth comes in with the founding, and it's an 18th century myth. Uh, Carl Becker, in uh, one of his books many, many years ago, said that one of the interesting things about the Enlightenment philosophers is they're always peering into the well of, the well of history to, to discern the natural order of things. He says the interesting thing is when they peer into this well of nature to discern the natural order, what they always wind up seeing is their own reflection. And that's what's really, really interesting about this myth of nature's nation. So what the founders discern in nature, the natural order of things, is a society dominated by men, by white men, by men of social standing, and men of money. That's, the, for them, the natural order of things. We've moved, thankfully, far beyond that today. But this myth of nature's nation has been a, a driving theme uh, in American life. And then shortly after the birth of the nation, because the, as you know, and as, as your listeners will know, the Constitution never once mentions God. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very much, a, a, we could say, an irreligious document. You know, the only, it mentions uh, religion only twice, and it's in, in negative terms. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of any religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So a lot of the Christians in the colonies after the founding were very concerned that with a constitution that had really left out any mention of grounding the nation in religious principles or certainly grounding it in God, they needed to do something about it. And they did. And they launched what came to be known as the Second Great Awakening, which broke out about 1801 and ran for about 30 years. But the Second Great Awakening was really an effort to Christianize the country and transform the country into a Christian nation. So the idea of Christian America has no legal standing, certainly, but it's been a powerful theme in American life. And I'm, you know, I suspect uh, probably didn't really begin to be diminished in its importance in American thinking until maybe the 1960s, uh, when the nation takes quite a turn in a secular direction, which sets up Jerry Falwell's moral majority in 19. Oh, wait, I want to get into this Second Great Awakening. It's 1801 to about 1830, 1831. Right. I never heard of the Second Great Awakening. I never heard of the First Great Awakening. What's the First Great Awakening? The Great Awakening, the, well, we don't usually don't call it the First Great Awakening. We just call it the Great Awakening. But the Great Awakening occurred in, in uh, the colonies, in the, the 13 colonies, about 1740. Uh, and once again, there was this concern that uh, religion was losing its power, losing its influence over the people. And uh, you, you and your listeners will all know the name of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was the great preacher of the, of the Great Awakening. There were other key preachers. He was a, he was a hellfire and damnation preacher, he right? Was that, he was that, but he was much more than that. He was quite an intellectual and a scientist in his own way for his time. He was a brilliant man. But Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield was the itinerant evangelist who traveled from the northernmost colonies to the southern southernmost colonies, uh, fanning the flames of this awakening, and uh, and that awakening, the the Great Awakening triggered. I'm going to slip this one in at this point. 
triggered another one of the great American myths, namely the myth of the millennial nation, because Jonathan Edwards believed that uh, given the fact that, that the colonies were really being deeply Christianized and, and really the, with a growing sense of religion, that, that the Great Awakening was really ushering in the golden age, the final millennium, the, you know, the millennium that, uh, of, of which he thought scripture spoke. But at any rate, so that's the Great Awakening. And then, of course, the revolution comes a few years after the Great Awakening, and wars typically are not very good for religion, and, and the nation, the, the colonies, once again, uh, there's a great diminishment of religious fervor. By the time the revolution is over, uh, a lot of people will say, you know, we really, you know, given the, given the revolution, and given the fact that the Constitution made no mention of God, then a lot of people said, you know, we've really got to do something to reclaim the Christian faith for this nation, and thus the Second Great Awakening. It was huge. And uh, uh, it, it began, in, it, well, there were several beginning points for the Second Great Awakening. One was at Yale University, where uh, Timothy Dwight was the president, and he's preaching revival to the students at Yale. And another beginning point was way out in the western part uh, of the nation at that time, Kentucky. And Barton W. Stone, and several of his colleagues in uh, around Cane Ridge, Kentucky, launched a huge, and when I say huge, thousands and thousands and thousands of people converged on this little community of Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801 for a long, long revival. And uh, so it broke out as spontaneous revivals in various locations, ranging from New England to Kentucky. And then, some preachers then began to consolidate the revival, to perpetuate it, and it really runs for a good 30 years. What do you mean by revival? Uh, bringing people to a, uh, how can I put this? To revive their commitment to Jesus, bringing them to a sense of uh, a, a, a deep reliance on prayer, a deep reliance on the supernatural, uh, because that, that's the kind of thing that many at that time felt was missing by the time the revolution is over and the Constitution is written. Uh, there's a lot of... It, well, here's another piece to the puzzle. Boy, we need to take a break now. So okay. when we come back, we're going to talk about these Great Awakenings and the myth of the millennial nation, because... Okay. Okay. That has nothing to do with the millennials today, but we'll get back to that okay. in, a, in, a, in a moment. Okay, okay. we're going to pause. And my guest for the show is Richard Hughes. He's a distinguished professor emeritus at both Pepperdine University and Messiah College, and he's the author of the book, Myths America Lives By, White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning. So you've told us about these two great awakenings. What, what are their role in, in the myths that we have now? Their role is to create the myth of Christian America. And again, you know, we mentioned early in the show that a myth is not something that's necessarily false. It could be false, it could be true. It's really immaterial, but it's, it's something, it's a story that gives people meaning. They live their lives by. And uh, by virtue of the, the, these two great revivals, the Great Awakening in the mid 18th century and the Second Great Awakening in the early 19th century, uh, this nation really came to be thought of as a Christian nation. Of course, it never was, was that in any legal sense. In fact, the, the Constitution, the First Amendment to the Constitution makes that illegal. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of any religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But in a very popular sense, it came to be thought of as, as a Christian nation. And let me take this just a little bit further. It wasn't just Christian. It was Protestant Christianity because Catholics were viewed as outsiders, unbelievers. Uh, they were the objects of great discrimination against them. 
So, so these two revivals were efforts to the Great Awakening to Protestantize the colonies, the Second Great Awakening to Protestantize the nation. And they were enormously effective. So my sense is that the notion that America is a Christian nation was simply assumed by most people, certainly down through, or at least up to the 1960s. Through the 60s. Okay, so I just want to get out the different major myths, and then we're going to get into the 60s, okay? So we've got the chosen one, we've got the nature one, the myth of the millennial nation. I'm not clear that exactly what that is yet, okay. so why don't you get into that one and explain that, and then we'll go through I the will. I will. So the Bible nowhere mentions the word millennium. But people who push the idea of a millennium base it on their interpretation of one verse in the biblical text, and it's in the book of Revelation. And the picture you get in this text is that the devil is bound. The angel comes, ties up the devil, puts the devil, according to the text, in the bottomless pit where the devil remains for a thousand years. It's a very esoteric text. What do you make of a text like this? Hard to know. But a lot of Christians from a very early period, this would, I mean, would go back to second century, third century, fourth century, throughout the Middle Ages, into the Reformation. Is it thousands, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, people interpreted that text as meaning this, that if the day is going to come when the devil is bound and put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, that means we will have a thousand years of peace and goodness and prosperity and wars will cease and killings will cease and falsehoods will cease and thievery will cease and we'll have this golden age of a thousand years. So th th this was a vision that's been a very, a very powerful vision throughout Christian history. So when the Great Awakening took place in the colonies, Jonathan Edwards seized on this vision of the millennium. And he said, well, look what's happening in, in New England. Christianity is sweeping the colonies. This must be the birth of the millennium. And of course it wasn't. But then uh, when the second great awakening got underway, the very same kind of vision took hold. And in time, the vision became, and I'm really oversimplifying this, obviously for the sake of time, but in time, the vision became should I say, secularized, so that many, many Americans simply assume, and I think still assume today, that a nation that is in sync with the way things are meant to be, i.e. nature's nation, is a nation that can, can offer to the rest of the world the same sort of blessings. And, and so this nation, if other nations will follow our lead, we will usher in the period of goodness and freedom and prosperity and democracy. Uh, you know, Rob, if, if, if your listeners were to get out the dollar, a $1 bill, they could see this in graphic form on the back of the $1 bill. If you've got their one in, in your wallet, you can pull it out and take a look at it. Then on the back of the dollar bill, you've got the great seal of the United States. And, and the, on one, one side of the back shows the front of the Great Seal, which is the eagle and the olive branches and the arrows and so on. The other side of the Great Seal, I think is on the left-hand side of the, of the back of the $1 bill, shows a pyramid. There it is. There it is. And you can see the pyramid unfinished. And the pyramid, if you look, if you look closely at it, the pyramid appears to be growing out of a desolate, barren wilderness. At the base of the pyramid, there's a date, 1776. So obviously the pyramid represents the birth of this country. The, the pyramid is the United States. The fact that the pyramid is growing out of this desolate, barren wilderness suggests that all human history prior to 1776 is a desolate, barren wilderness when compared with what's transpiring now in the 1776. Underneath 
the pyramid is a Latin phrase, novus ordo seclorum, a new order of the ages, and altogether new, there's nothing ever been like this in the history of the human race. Who put this on the dollar? Founders. The founders imagined this vision. Who put it on? The, I'm not sure when it came with the dollar, but that seal was drawn up by the founders. By the a very old vision. And above above the pyramid is the eye of God. There's an eye. That's the eye of God. And there's a Latin phrase above the eye of God that says "annuit coeptus," meaning He has smiled on our beginnings. God has blessed the birth of this nation. And the fact that the pyramid is unfinished points to the millennial vision. The pyramid will be finished when this nation spreads uh, liberty and democracy around the globe. When these, and Protestantism. And Protestantism, yes. When Protestantism, liberty, and democracy spread around the globe, then the millennium will be fully realized, and this nation is the vehicle which will bring all this about. And there it is on the dollar bill. And most Americans have no idea. They carry this around in their back pocket or their purse, and they have no idea. Okay, and uh, that there are more. Let me look at the. We've talked about the nation, nature's nation, the millennial nation. You've got the Christian nation, in which you really have kind of discussed, but haven't specified. And then myths of American capitalism and the innocent nation. The, you know, the American capitalism, I, I don't call that a myth. You know, what I'm saying is there's some mythic dimensions to capitalism. But the fifth myth is simply the myth of the innocent nation. So the assumption is that if this nation was chosen by God for a special mission in the world, uh, if this nation is rooted and grounded in the way God Almighty meant for things to be, if this nation is at, at root a Christian nation ushering in a golden age for all humankind, then obviously we must be an innocent nation. So other nations have blood on their hands. We don't because the wars in which we're engaged are wars for good, wars for righteousness. And you know, what, what sort of reinforced that vision for the late 20th century was World War II. I mean, it was very easy to, to understand that war as the war, the great war of, of ultimate good versus ultimate evil. And good prevailed, the innocent nation prevailed. So the notion of America as an innocent nation because of all these other myths is a very powerful thing. Now, the, the thing that, that, that really I had never once thought of these myths as standing in the service to the larger myth of white supremacy until James Noel pointed this out to me. And what, it, what, it, what I began to see is that white supremacy really is the dominant driving myth in this country. Black people understand that. Most white people don't. And the, the, what the function of these other myths is to assure us that in spite of our white supremacy, we remain innocent after all. After all, we're chosen. No matter how nasty, no matter how ugly, no matter how many blacks we lynch, we're innocent. Sure. sure. We don't tell those stories. I mean, think, think about this. Germany, after World War II, came to terms with its atrocities. They came to terms with it. Think about the atrocities that we've committed in this nation. And I'm thinking of South, South Africa. They also had they a commission. They came to terms with their atrocities. Yes. The, the Indian removal, uh, the murder of Native Americans, putting them on reservations. We've never come to terms with this. We don't, we don't deal with it. We don't think about it. Slavery, reparations would be very much in order. But a nation that's convinced that we're innocent and doesn't give any thought to this is not going to uh, is not going to pursue reparations. Yes. And so I, I so what you're basically I, saying I is that our innocence is if we compare ourselves and the atrocities we've committed with the atrocities, say, Germany committed, Germany came to terms with it. We have yet to come to terms 
with these kinds of issues. That's why James Cone wrote his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Do you, I don't know if you know that book or not. No, tell us about it. Yeah, it's a very, very important book. James Cone was the leading black uh, liberation theologian from the 1960s until his death about, about a year ago. Wrote a lot on black, uh, uh, black liberation theology. Toward the end of his life, he wrote a, a wonderful book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And here's the thesis. That between 1880, roughly the end of Reconstruction, and roughly 1940, so for a 50 to 60 year period between 1880 and 1930, 1940, thousands and thousands of black people were lynched in this country. Lynched for what? For not shuffling your feet? For looking a white person in the eye? For not saying, sir? I mean, for all these trumped up uh, notions that black people had been an affront to, to white. So these people were lynched. Where were they lynched? Well, they were lynched all over the country, even in California, but predominantly in the Bible Belt. And these lynchings were not done by 10 or 12 outlaws who, under cloak of darkness, seize someone and take them out and lynch them and try to. to uh, get away with it. Not at all. Often these lynchings, announcements of the lynchings were published in the newspapers. The Atlanta Constitution, for example, ran a, uh, an advertisement on the lynching of a man named, named Sam Hose. Sam Hose will be lynched on such and such a date. How many people showed up for those lynchings? Thousands and thousands and thousands of people came to the lynchings. It was sport. It was like football. It was like the Olympics. It was like you know, you're going to a sport. Parents wrote notes to teachers. Please excuse Johnny. Please excuse Susie because we're, we have a picnic. We're going to the lynching. We're going to have a picnic lunch and watch the lynching. When the lynching was over, people cut off fingers, cut off noses, cut off genitals, took them home with them as souvenirs. Now, so the Cohen's question is, who perpetrated this? If there were 10,000 people or even 2,000 people at a given lynching in Atlanta, Georgia, who were these people? Well, we know exactly who they were. For the most part, they were people who would be in church on Sunday, who claimed to be Christian. And here's Cohen's point. He says, the, the irony here is that these people worshiped a savior who was lynched on a tree, hung on a tree, lynched. And here they now are lynching innocent people and never make the connection between their actions of lynching and the actions that lynch the person that they claim to, claim to worship. It's a huge irony. That's the book that I was asked to comment on in 2012 when James Noel said to me, Professor, you left out the most important of all the American myths. What's that? The myth of white supremacy. And it's still current now. This oh. is not something that's historic. This is now. It's absolutely. So you talk about, you, you wrote to me about how things changed in the 60s that, the, the, that uh, up until then, this was a very, very top-down kind of it a- It does seem to me. Thing. It does seem to me. And you know, when you think about, I mean, I haven't given a lot of thought to the top-down, bottom-up dimension of American history. You've got me thinking about this now, so I want to think more about it. But certainly in, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, we have a very much a top-down kind of world. I mean, we have a very strong president, FDR, who comes in and takes bold steps, and he needed to do that to save the country. And we had a, we're a very top-down country, certainly from the end of the Great Depression up until, say, 1955. 
that the civil rights movement was clearly a bottom-up movement. Uh, the freedom movement, the, the, the women's liberation movement, the environmental movement, the anti-war movement, all these movements percolated up from the bottom and they transformed American society. We will never be the same, transformed it in far-reaching ways. And it's always seemed to me that, 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 that the theme that has driven the religious right and the political right ever since the end of the 1960s is an effort to restore what they think of as the American golden age. The golden age of the 1950s before uh, gays and lesbians and transgender people came out of the closet. Uh, the golden age of the 1950s when, when, when we made sure that black people stayed in their place. You know, the golden age, so it was a golden age for certain people, but a horrible period for many other people. But it seems to me that the 1960s... So it was a golden age of, age of authoritarianism and repression and discrimination and... Racism, and racism, sexism. Oh, yes, indeed. But for, for someone like me, so I, you know, in 1950, I'm seven years old. In 1960, I'm 17 years old. So I grew up in the 1950s. For me, growing up in West Texas, it was a wonderful period for me. But it never occurred to me how much oppression went on in that period, how, how people of color were oppressed in my own community. I wasn't paying any attention to that because I was the beneficiary of that golden age for white people. And you talk, you talk about the um, restoration that's a concept that you get into talk about restoration yes, and you mentioned that in your book as well is a very very important myth uh, and then and restoration is a theme i suppose as old as as humanity uh, there, there was a wonderful scholar who passed away some years ago named richard iliadi and he wrote a very important book called the myth of the eternal return and and his point was that that primitive people constantly tried to, to, to live in the context of, of the birth of their world, the, the, the strong time when the world first began. So even though they were nomadic people, they would take their, for example, their totem pole with them and they'd plant the pole and the pole really became the axis mundi, the center of the world. So living in the center of the world at the place of the creation. So, Think about the American founding. The American founding was very much a, an attempt to restore something. What was it they were trying to restore? Nature, a nation in sync with the way things were meant to be. Uh, Thomas Paine, your, your readers will likely remember Thomas Paine as Jefferson's good friend and in many ways a sidekick. Thomas Paine wrote that in the beginning, all the world was America. And think about that. That's a powerful statement. In the beginning, all the world was America. In other words, the world was pristine. It was pure. It was natural. It was in sync with the will of God. But then this terrible corruption set in and corrupted civilizations and corrupted politics. And this goes on for centuries and centuries. And then in 1776, this new nation is born which is really is an effort to restore the golden age that existed at the beginning of time. I and mean, that's really the, the vision that we get from people like Jefferson and, and Thomas Paine. John Locke uh, said it as well. He spoke of America as, as, as the rebirth of a kind of a golden age. Okay, so, so we need to take another break. And then I want to talk to you about counter myths if there are any what they could be what they would be and we'll do that right after this break okay my guest for this show is richard hughes he's a distinguished professor emeritus at both pepperdine university and messiah college and he's the author of many books including this one we're discussing, Myths America Lives By, White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning. 
So are there counter myths? Are there new myths that can emerge? Can, how do we get rid of these toxic myths that we live by and replace them? You know, that, that's a huge question. And I'm not sure that, I don't know that that's even possible. Uh, I have been criticized by some people for the way I concluded this book by saying that these myths do have some redeeming qualities if we could reframe the myths. So for example, if we could think of chosenness as chosen uh, for genuine equality, chosen for freedom for every, you know, for everyone. You know, I tell you, I'm Jewish and, you know, I know Orthodox and Zionist Jews who think, oh, aren't you, don't you feel great that you're one of the chosen ones, which disgusts me really. Mm -hmm. But the progressive Jews talk about the way that we need to think about chosenness is we're the ones who have to tikkun olam, heal the world. We're the ones who have a responsibility to make things right. And that's a kind of a chosenness that I think is, 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 a, is a much more positive way of thinking about things. But the problem is, it, 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 there, it's a good way to think of it if we think, of, if we project this into the future. In other words, this is a goal we should be pursuing. But then if we come to think we are chosen because we have achieved it, yeah. then we're in the, back in the very same problem. Well, the the word that, that keeps coming to mind is delusion. I mean, this is delusional crap, it's you know, delusional. and it was, it started with the founding of the United States. It's, it started with racism and it started with people with power, give it, having the power. It started with a constitution that did not treat everybody equally. And uh, what you've done very nicely is really lay out how this has just really, it's, it's become an institutional core part of the identity of Americans. This it, it has. And so when you say, how do we frame counter myths? I mean, um, you don't invent a myth. No one can invent it. No one can superimpose a different myth. Well, what about Germany and South Africa? Has, have they done anything that has changed their stories, the, the defining stories for them? I don't know enough about either one of those nations. Well, get on it. Come on now. <laughs> but, 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 what I, but what I do know is when they came to terms with their atrocities, that in itself would help to redefine the myth. I mean, Germany, Germany goes into uh, the, the Nazi era with many of the same illusions that the United States has had. You know, the whole notion of, you know, well, the master race, master race, white supremacy. These are two very, uh, very similar kinds of ideas. Uh, the Aryan race, the, the, the pure race. I mean, all those kinds of notions were so powerful in Germany and had been there for a long, long, long time. Uh, but when Germany finally comes to terms with the atrocities, I think then, then the myths do... So let's go back to the 1960s. In some ways, Martin Luther King, the freedom movement, gave us the opportunity to reframe our myths. You remember he said at one point, uh, I think it may have been in the speech he gave, uh, in the I Have a Dream speech, I think in that speech, but he, he said, he said, America has, we, we've come to cash the check and we've tried to cash it before and it always comes back marked insufficient funds. But we know there's plenty of money in that bank. We're here to cash that check. And so King and the people who led that movement really called our bluff and helped us to redefine and rethink our myths. But then the backlash, the, the counter myth that comes at, at the end of the 1960s, the effort to say, no, 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 we don't want to redefine our myths. We want to claim the myths exactly the way they have always been framed with white supremacy at the center. That's what's going on today. And in my view, this is what's been going on with the Christian right for the last 40 years. 45 and, years. You know, I'm one of my most recent guests wrote, wrote a book, uh, and Nelson wrote a book about it, uh, about how about 40 years ago this started. 
and how there's a lot of money behind it and how it's not even based on a belief that is God-based or Bible-based. No, it's that's right. used. This, this whole concept is used to get people to get behind a, po a politics that helps out people who want to make money, who, who want to control people. It's no longer a, a, a myth that serves any religion at all. No, no, that's exactly right. And uh, it, it's, it's really quite ironic that you have so many people in the Christian right who, who claim, when you, when you think about what Jesus was all about, and it, it's an upside down vision. I mean, it has nothing to do with power. It really has everything to do with bottom up. You relinquish power. You know, if you want to live, you die. If you want to have influence, go to the back of the line. Uh, you know, all this upside down stuff. If you want to have eternal life, sell your goods, give to the poor. You know, all that kind of upside down stuff. So here you have people who claim allegiance to Jesus and his teachings but for whom it's really now all about power, political power. So, uh, and then that leads me to think of what George Washington said in his farewell address, that no republic can exist without virtue and morals, and that religion is the carrier traditionally of those morals, of that virtue. So when, when religion becomes corrupted, as it has in this country, profoundly corrupted, then what happens to the virtue and the moral framework that can sustain a republic? So bottom line, Rob, uh, I would say we are in deep, deep trouble. And what do we do with these myths? We had a chance to really reframe them. I think Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X, I mean, all kinds of leaders in the freedom movement gave us that opportunity and we could have run with that, but instead we launched a counter movement to bury that vision and really return to what so many of us perceived as the golden age of the 1950s, which was a golden age for people who look like me. You know, you have a quote in the book, the religion that has dominated this country has never been the Christian faith. Um, and if, if it's not, then what is it? You know, if it's not the Christian faith, it seems to me it's really been American nationalism framed by these myths. And wh when I say it's never been the Christian faith, what, I, what I'm saying there is I'm holding up an ideal vision of the Christian faith. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at what Jesus was all about. And you say Jesus was a very bottom-up person. Profoundly bottom-up. Versus the current Christianity, which is so top-down. Top-down. Jesus was profoundly bottom-up. Uh, How? His, his, his favorite phrase, the phrase he talked about all the time, was the kingdom of God. And if you want to know what he meant by that, it's not very hard to find out. When I did a book some years ago called Christian America and the Kingdom of God. And the, the premise of the book was that these people who push for Christian America their vision is the absolute opposite of the kingdom of God because Christian America is about power and dominance and the kingdom of God is this upside down, bottom up kind of vision. So Jesus... Well, what is it? What, tell me more about the kingdom of God. Okay, let me just give you two quick illustrations. This will come out of scripture. So... Many of your readers will remember the story of the, the young man, the rich young man. We call him the rich young ruler who goes to Jesus and says, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, keep the law. And the guy says, well, I've done that since I was a child. He's really feeling good about himself. And he turns to walk away. And Jesus said, hey, come back. There's one more thing I want to tell you. He said, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, sell your goods and give to the poor and then come follow me, you'll have eternal life. And the, and the text says he couldn't do it, and he went away sorrowful, 
because he was very rich. And then Jesus comments how difficult it is for the rich, the powerful, the people on top, to enter the kingdom of God. So you draw the conclusion from that, that, that the kingdom of God is that place where the poor are cared for. Let me give you another, just one other example. The only place in the entire biblical text where we get a full picture of the final judgment is in Matthew 25. And so here's this picture. You get, you get uh, Jesus with all the nations of the earth, all the people standing before him, and he divides the sheep from the goats, according to the text. And the sheep, he says, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. Enter into the kingdom of God. Well, it is pretty clear. So the kingdom of God is that place where we practice an upside down kind of religion. And the heart of the religion is caring for marginalized people, caring for vulnerable people, reaching out to the poor, clothing the naked, housing the, the uh, people who have no place to call home. So that's when I say that, that the Christian religion has never been the religion of the United States. That's what I mean by it. The Christian religion has been used as a handmaiden to promote American nationalism and American dominance. And that's just the absolute opposite of, of, of the way Jesus frames the kingdom of God. The kingdom Are there organizations that really reflect the kingdom of God? Yes. Are there? And there are churches that do. There are organizations. And, it, and it's not just Christians. There are many Jews, many Muslims, many Buddhists. I mean, many people participate in this kingdom of God. Many Christians do. Many Christian organizations do. But, but I would still contend that on balance, the Christian religion has never, ever been the religion of the United States. I mean, this has never really been a Christian nation in, in, any, in any deep or meaningful sense. It's been a Christian nation in terms of window dressing, in terms of some fairly artificial allegiances. And the Christian faith has been used by politicians to promote their vision. So what you're saying is it's never been a real Christian nation. Never been a real, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we don't have that much time left. And, and you, you talk about coronavirus and, and, and what it's showing us about these myths. And You know, you, you've really got me to thinking, Rob. Uh, you, you, you got me thinking about this upside down. And the way you framed upside down, you talked about... Uh, you mean bottom up. I mean, I'm sorry, bottom up. The way you frame bottom up, you talked about the bottom up means we're connected to one another. It's a, you know, it's a connected kind of a vision. Well, the fact of the matter is that the myths America lives by are supposed to be our connectors. They're supposed to connect us, bind us together as a people. The fact of the matter is it has bound together certain people and left a lot of other people out. And that's what I did not realize until I was 69 years old. Uh, so I was reading this really powerful piece from The Atlantic from about a week ago. I have it here in front of me. The title is, We Are Living in a Failed State by George Packer. And Packer says in this essay, uh, I'm going to find it. He said, the virus should have united Americans against a common threat. With different leadership, it might have. Instead, even it is spread from blue to red areas, attitudes broke down along familiar lines. The virus should have been the great leveler. And I'm thinking it had, it's divided us, profoundly divided us. The poor are suffering the most, the rich are suffering the least. Uh, there are heroic efforts on the part of many people. There are many Christians and Jews, serious Jews, serious Christians working hard at this issue. But I think the virus has revealed to us 
the hollowness of many of our myths and that the myths really are not doing what we always thought they should do or would do. And, and I, let me hasten to add again that the myths did bind us together, but they bound only a certain group of people together. They, they bound people that look like me. They bound us together. And, you know, and I've got to say again, I mean, the, the notion of white supremacy is a notion I had never even thought about. Well, I mean, I knew there were white supremacists, obviously. You know, KKK, white nationalists, and those guys are out there. I know that, of course. But the notion that white supremacy is a driving theme it never crossed my mind until I was 69 years old. Somehow I mean, we've got to wake up the nation to it. And we got to wrap. So any last words? Not really. Uh, I think I've said it. <laughs> unless you have another question for me. No, you've been great. This has been a fascinating interview and it's a pleasure. Uh, so my guest for this show has been Richard Hughes. He's a distinguished professor emeritus at both Pepperdine University and Messiah College. And he's the author of the book, Myths America Lives By, White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning. Thanks so much for being on the Thank show. Thank you, Rob.